Farzad, interoperability is at the heart of your overall effort. Uh, would you tell us what are some of the critical barriers to achieving the goal of nationwide interoperability, and how are you working to overcome many of these challenges and obstacles? The challenges to interoperability, widespread interoperability, na national interoperability in a system that's incredibly fragmented. You have hundreds of different vendors. You have proprietary vendor interests. You don't have a strong and compelling business case. You don't have established structures for transferring trust between organizations, right? That's a major, massive, massive challenge. And I think fundamentally we need to do two things. One, we need to recognize there's not going to be in a country as diverse as ours with partners and exchanges and transactions that are as varied as we have, there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, it's not going to be a cookie cutter of like, here, everyone do this, right? Everyone use this mechanism. Uh, the, the corollary to that is that health information exchange is a verb, not a noun. Mm -hmm. There was, I think, a certain stage in our, uh, in our thinking at, uh, nationally, there was the idea that there were going to be Rios in every community, and that's how all information exchange was going to happen. I think they're a critical part of the puzzle, but that's not the only way that information exchange can happen or indeed is happening. There's also direct communication between one provider and another provider, one hospital and another hospital, one vendor and another vendor. And that's okay. It's good. All exchange is good. And there's another approach, which is the patient getting their own information and sharing it with whoever they want to share it with. That's fantastic. Not every patient is going to take that up, but if they want to, they should be able to serve as their own kind of HIE of one, uh, as it were. But all of these, while there's a lot of variability and there's beauty in that variability, we can't be reinventing the wheel. And so there's got to be common building blocks to this. And that's where the standards come in. So to say, you want to exchange you know, uh, documents in a query model, or you want to exchange documents with a patient, or you want to exchange documents between each other, let's standardize on what those documents look like so that we don't have to do that, that fitting every single time for every single transaction. So we brought people together and say, hey, there used to be religious wars fought over, do you use the consolidated, you know, the C32 CCD or do you use the ASTM E31 CCR? And we said, look, you know, guys, we really don't care, but we, we want to pick one as a country. And it turned out that we couldn't pick one. We had to create kind of an amalgam that took the strengths of both. And we resolved 1,500 technical issues, problems with either one or the other in creating and getting endorsed and consensus endorsement from the Standards Development Organization for the first time in our nation's history, a single standard for how patient information is, is summarized together. Same with standards for uh, the vocabularies, having a single standard for medication lists for crying out loud instead of five different proprietary uh, vocabularies. And uh, there's also the standards around the transport and the protocol so that everyone can catch and throw with directed messaging and we're moving on towards query-based exchange. So those are the technical standards that a lot, that is firmly in our purview and, and frankly a lot of attention paid to. But I just want to mention that it's not enough to have the technical standards in place. And we are uh, making good progress on getting the technical standards through the 2014 standards and certification criteria. But you also need to have a reason to share. Mm -hmm. It's got to be, you know, sharing has got to be caring. And you got to be profitable to share, not to hoard patient data. So the incentives of the different participants in the healthcare system have to be aligned with sharing information, not locking it in. And that's why things like the readmission adjustment mm -hmm. makes such a big difference, where if I just discharged a patient, I, as a hospital, care financially that they get hooked up with their primary care doc. That if they show up in someone else's emergency room three days later, I really want to send them the information about their discharge. I want the patient to have information about their discharge. So it's just a paper and JAMA about how often, and it's no surprise, but it's shocking nonetheless, how often patients really don't understand their discharge instructions from the hospital. And of course, you're gonna have worse problems and more complications and poor coordination if that happens. So. Uh, one, standards. Two, the financial alignment. Mm -hmm. And then three is trust. And once you have the cost and benefit right, you reduce the cost through standards, you increase the benefits through policy changes and payment changes, then information will flow at the speed of trust. And so how can we create mechanisms, and you can't force it, 
but how can we create mechanisms that will foster a quicker sense of trusting relationships developing between different participants in the system. A lot of it has to start local because that's where most healthcare is shared. Uh, but setting some policy rules of the road mm -hmm. can help get that forward. Actually, I'd like to, that's a great follow on because I'd like to talk to you about that effective governance or rules to the role. How important is that? And your office chose to, yes. pr pr to do a framework rather yes. than direct regulation. Why is that? So this was, this was labeled Zen and the Art of Government by someone. <laughs> the, the idea was uh, that we initially went into this thinking was, okay, in order to have trust, uh, these organizations that will help move information around, they need to be trusted. And there need to be common rules about how they operate, conditions for interoperability on standards, conditions for trust uh, and on privacy and their privacy and security practices, on how they deal with meaningful choice or consent on the part of patients, what they do with the data once they have it and the reuse or lack of reuse of the data, what their business practices are in terms of putting up barriers or not, in terms of exchanging information or provider directories. So a whole list of these are, you know, these are the conditions for to be an accredited or something, you know, uh, nationally accredited exchange organization. And we put it out there. In not in a rule, but in a request for information. What do, what do people think about this framework? And it was informed by all the discussions we had in our health IT policy committee. And what we heard back was, guys, we really appreciate you wanting to help, but <laughs> but there's a lot happening right now, and you you may be trying to solve problems that don't exist, or we don't know what the problems are. And by doing regulations, by even saying you're going to do regulations, you're going to absolutely freeze everything while we wait for daddy to tell us what we can do. And that there's so much happening, that so much dynamism in the private sector around exchange that picking any, any one model could stifle, could have the opposite effect of what you want. And instead, they said, the vast majority of the comments was, tell us the principles. Don't get too detailed. Tell us what are the principles and work with private public collaborations that are already coming together around those rules of the road. And so we said, well, it's time to listen. We're not forestalling the possibility of doing it in the future if the needs emerge. But for now, maybe the better part of Valor is to wait and to see and to support and to lean into it and to put out our statement of principles and the framework that you referred to, to have cooperative agreements with now two emerging governance entities. One is called Direct Trust that is creating an accreditation framework for health information service providers. The other is a group of states led out of New York, the New York eHealth Initiative Collaborative, and to bring those guidances together and then to have a forum for governance discussions through the National eHealth Collaborative. So that's what we're doing. We're leaning into it, but in a non-regulatory way. And, you know, we remain open, I think, if it turns out that the, the way things are going, there's a sense that we need that regulatory approach to it. We won't hesitate to do that. Uh, but I think there's some promising signs that actually there are these governance approaches are maturing and there are developing and they are meeting uh, meeting the need.